Thank you, Judge Pinson. I'm delighted for the opportunity to speak at Dynamic Walking again. I'll be talking about work I've done with Moritz Maus, who's a grad student in Andrew Cypress' lab. Uh, John Guggenheimer, who's a pretty well-known dynamicist. Uh, and we've been looking at human running data. Um, so th there's a fair consensus that one can use limit cycles as a model for running. And I'll, I'm going to be talking about a way of combining two types of models for what happens around such a limit cycle. One is very general models, flow K theory, basically the first order linearization around the limit cycle. And the other is the use of low order models such as templates. So basically using lower dimensional dynamical systems as models for particle dynamics. Um, now, uh, in the last few years, I've developed a method with John Guggenheimer, we're calling it data-driven flow K analysis. It's basically trying to use trajectory data to reconstruct how perturbations evolve around the limit cycle. Uh, unlike uh, stationary systems, limit cycles have complicated uh, evolution for, for perturbation. Uh, I've also done some uh, theoretical work on what happens when we have hybrid transitions in this world, and, and if anyone's interested in that, we can talk about it later. Um, in terms of lower order models, uh, this idea of templates and anchors, I'd like to mention three, three papers that, that relate. First, this is sort of a basic work on SLIP as a template for human running, for example, Blakeman's paper from 93. Um, I'll be talking about a model that's related to 3D SLIP, and, and that was first done by Dustin in 05. And then in particular, about predictions that appear in Sean Carver's work with uh, Noah Kahn and John Guggenheimer and in Carver's thesis about lateral stability and deadbeat control in, uh, in running. So what's our data set? As, uh, as I believe my predecessor here said, you need a crap load of data to do this. And, and so the data for us has been seven subjects, each uh, doing runs of 100, 1,800 strides. So these are about 20 minute runs on the treadmill. Uh, 33 points, there are three different treatments. I'm only going to be discussing data from simple running, but we've done some perturbation analyses as well. And the first thing you do when you look at this data is you try and normalize your strides. Uh, we've done that, so that's basically trying to reconstruct the limit cycle of the motion. Uh, we're using a method for recovering phase out of the kinematic data and then reparameterizing all the data relative to phase. Uh, this is a method I developed with John a few years back. Uh, I should just note, and this is what you see at the bottom um, subplot here. The top plot is the variance you get if you use a uh, regular kind of phase reconstruction based on touchdown events. The bottom is the variance you get using our phase estimate. Basically, you get a better model. And furthermore, you get a model that has a uniform uh, noise rather than a phase dependent noise. So that's useful for various hypotheses. Um, and what we find after we do that, we want to say, see whether that limit cycle is actually consistent over a trial. And the answer is actually completely not. So what we did, and this is the first result in the top, is we take all these strides and we treat them as a huge vector. So each cycle, each stride is now one huge vector in an ensemble of 1,800 vectors. And we do PCA on them and then we look at how these principal components evolve over time. And what we see is human running changes all the time over the order of minutes, not seconds, not single strides, but over the order of minutes. This is one trial, first principal component changing drastically over time. Other individuals had other changes, but the take home message is the fact that the same human is running at the same speed on the same treadmill doesn't mean they're doing the same thing. And if you don't take that into account in the way you do your data analysis, you're going to get spurious large eigenvalues that don't tell you anything about the stride to stride dynamics. They tell you about these long term trends. So look for them and watch out for them. When we remove these, we can now try and look at the results from our data through the flow analysis. So, so just to orient you, what we're seeing here is ground reaction force. So this is hill strike, stance, flight, second hill strike, stance, flight. And this plot is showing us the quality of our prediction from, let's say, the slice at phase zero to all the different other slices around the orbit. So we're trying to predict what the future of a perturbation is going to be based on our current state of the orbit. And what we see is one cycle into the future, all of these are 90% of the variance remaining. So basically, terrible predictor. We can only get rid of about 10% of the variance. You think that's kind of hopeless. But actually, one step back, our prediction is pretty good. And so uh, we're trying to understand why this might be so. And here's one reason why this might be so. 
if all the information about a perturbation is gone after a strike, so basically we went back to zero error, if we had a deadbeat controller, looking one stride into the future, we'd have no predictive value whatsoever. When we plot the scatter plot of the eigenvalues of these return map matrices, so now we're creating many, many, many return map matrices through a bootstrap procedure. Computing their eigenvalues, doing a scatter plot of these eigenvalues in the complex plane. Notice that this circle is 0 0.5. So this is 0 0.5 means half the perturbation is gone after a cycle. All of the eigenvalues we see in a 30 some dimensional matrix are pretty much all less than 0.3. So down to our noise, this is pretty much our noise. And that means that we can barely distinguish this from a deadbeat controller. We didn't like that this is a big splotch, so we used an improved eigenvalue estimation procedure that, that Manon was hoping to talk about and didn't get to. Um, and that just reinforces the fact that this is a deadbeat controller. So the second key result we see here is after you take away all these long-term trends, there is no stride-to-stride -stride error remaining. Basically, all the error is canceled within a stride tree, and it's not canceled within a step. Um, so that's what we get from the Floquet analysis. But now, uh, we really want to look at what we get when we add slip. And so we use a method for recovering uh, parameters for a slip model from the kinematic data. This, uh, this is in a paper that's currently under review in Journal of Biomechanics, but you should ask Andre for details of the method if you need to do that. And what we find out if we look at the slip parameters, so these are four-dimensional states for slip, apex to apex, it's unstable. That's kind of depressing. That means that slip is a terrible model. It doesn't give us any prediction for what's going to happen except the running is unstable. Well, we try and address that by augmenting slip with parameters. So there are parameters for the slip model, parameters like leg length, landing angles, leg stiffness, total energy change. Add these parameters. So now this is a nine dimensional system at apex, it's eight dimensional. We can now try and regress, just using linear regression, what control law is being used to change these slip parameters stride to stride. If we do that, we get the following result. The augmented slip, all the eigenvalues are tiny, and they look kind of like what we got in our flip analysis. Without that feedback law, huge positive eigenvalues, the system is completely unstable. So basically, you can model what humans are doing reasonably well by saying you have a slip and you adjust your parameters with a linear feedback law every apex. Okay, that's kind of nice, but what, what happens when you compare those predictions to the Floquet model? So the Floquet model is always a perfect predictor, zero remaining variance right at the point where you start projecting into the future, and then it gets worse and worse and worse. One step into the future, which is right here, it's still predicting pretty well, but the causal slip, that's this red line which uses information from the past to predict the future, does pretty poorly. So this gap that we see right here potentially could be improved upon by using a different kind of feedback law that wasn't present in the state variable with slip. Well, can we do that? Can we find new variables which enable us to better predict how to control our slip? It turns out we can. And when we do that, we get what are essentially three variables. So these are weight teams of factors on these variables. These are all our state variables. It's a whole zoo of state variables. But the important thing is these actually break up into two groups. There's one factor which predicts the splay angle of the leg, how far the leg is going to point out sideways in the next stride. And then there are two factors, one of which looks at the center of mass height, and the other looks at a combination of actual variables. And these two variables, so just these this two-dimensional data will tell you how to set all these five slip parameters for that next stand. So we've taken slip down to a feedback law that's essentially, if you care only about the sagittal plane, a two-dimensional feedback law that actually recovers over 90% of the predictive value that we got from using the entire 30-some dimensional state. So the, the last part of this talk is basically saying data-driven Floquet analysis combined with SLIP gave us a new and quantitatively verified template. It's an ankle SLIP, that is, it uses, uses data from the ankle position to control a SLIP model. And with that, we can recover pretty much everything that we could 
do in terms of prediction with, with a full-blown flow K model, which doesn't have much analytic structure. Um, and with that, I'm done. Thank you. So that's, that's really tough because these, these principal components are in an entire stride of 30 some markers. So trying to reduce them to something I can describe in words is very hard. Uh, the simple answer is I, I can't tell you. There's a question over here on this side. Andy, please. Can you just go over what was your reduced control model? So uh, my reduced control model is when you reach an apex, take these two vectors, these are vectors, which are, which are uh, weighting on left ankle minus center of mass position and left ankle velocity minus center of mass velocity. So these are parameters that have to do with where that leg that's about to land is at that moment. And your center of mass height, your center of mass z. Take these two numbers, map them linearly to a change in your five parameters for the slip, and that's it. That's the control model. So it's a five by two matrix, or excuse me, a, a, a five by, um, yeah. it's, this, one, it's, it's one control output, two control inputs, and two gains. No gains. There are five control inputs into slip that were generated from Two output variables. So the linear combination of the five. No, these are linear combinations of the state variables. But there are two output variables from the state generating three inputs to slip in five inputs to slip. Yeah. Okay, so let's take one more question and while that question is being asked, can the next speaker please come up? Please. Yes. That's, a, that's an excellent question. I'd love to do that. We have some suspicion that that's not the best state to use. Um, redoing this analysis for another state is a lot of work, but that's, that's one of the things we should definitely do. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you clearly. It shouldn't change the flow came multiplies. Empirically, we've, th th there's something strange going on when you do data-driven methods, and sometimes the flow came multipliers change some. That's an entire interesting discussion. This shows up in some of Dingwell's work on flow came analysis of, of data as well. But um, yeah, the, the flow came multipliers shouldn't change if you change section. All right, that sounds good. Thank you very much, Chad.